creating a uh, dynamic curve and how to control that curve in Maya 2013. It's actually very similar in older versions of Maya except that uh, in the older versions of Maya we need to work with the hair menu. Uh, in 2013 hair has been removed and now we have end hair which is basically just the hair options have been moved to be included in the end dynamics so they're actually di uh, calculate it based on a nucleus that can also interact with uh, your standard geometry which is actually really useful because it makes it a little easier and to control and to get the dynamic ele elements to interact because they pretty much interact by default so the first thing we need to do is create a curve so I'm going to switch to my side view and using my uh, CV my uh, I'm going to create, I'm going to use the CV curve tool, and I'm just going to click out a curve really quick. And just to make it a little easier to see, I'm going to just click it out at an angle so that when it becomes dynamic, it's a little easier to uh, keep track of the changes. Now that we have our basic curve created, this is going to be our original curve. So I'm going to switch back to my perspective view. Or actually, for now, I'll just work in this view. So we have our curve. Now we need to make it dynamic, which is pretty easy. You're going to go to your uh, the top left-hand corner of Maya, and you have the pull-down. And from the pull-down, you switch to di N dynamics, not dynamics, but N dynamics. And then your top menus will switch so that you have access to the end mesh and end hair and end constraints and so on. Basically, so you have access to the end cloth menus. And then using end hair, which is just like your standard hair, except that it's going to be influenced by the nucleus, you're going to select your regular curve. And you're going to tell Maya to make selected curves dynamic. And once you see it actually turns this little magenta color, and you see it creates a little uh, nucleus icon. If you rewind and just play on your timeline, it should move a little bit. Well, it would make it a little easier to see that movement. Because now we're going to talk about controlling it. So if while you have your curve selected, you can go to the attribute editor, press control A on the keyboard. And it brings up your attribute editor. And you'll see right away in your attribute editor that it says hair system shape. And that's where you're pretty much going to see all of your controls for the, the dynamic curve. Also under nucleus, this is where that's uh, basically what's doing the calculation of the dynamic behavior. For now though, we're going to look at the uh, hair shape and there's another one, the follicle. I'm just going to select, just drag select, so I'm selecting the original curve and the dynamic curve that was created based on the original curve. And then if you go to follicle shape, you'll see some of the base settings that are also controlling how the dynamic curve is tethered. Because right now when you create a dynamic curve, it uses something called point lock to lock the ends to the original curve. So if I, for example, went into the dynamic settings for the hair system, and I'll turn the stiffness, which is pretty much this gradient uh, controller here. I'm going to take this and drag it all the way to the bottom. So this is now, the stiffness is at zero. So now if I actually press play, and let me give myself a little more time on the timeline, I'm going to switch it to about 240 frames. I'm going to rewind it. By the way, your playback for the timeline, uh, to get it is playback speed to around uh, play every frame max real time, or just play every frame. If you do real time, it tends to, uh, it may miss a few calculations, so it may not behave as it's supposed to. So as you can see, now that's the dynamic curve, it drops away from the original curve. Now, the great thing about creating a dynamic curve is you can get, go back to the original curve. Since your dynamic curve is always based on the original, you can actually 
sort of rebuild that curve using some of the surface controls. So if you uh, switch to your surface menus, you can press uh, F4 on your keyboard and switch to the surface menus. And then under Edit Curves, you can tell it to rebuild your curve if you want to add more spans to it, for example. So let's say I wanted to add eight spans to it. You can tell it to rebuild it. And then if I rewind, you'll see that my dynamic curve is still perfectly dynamic. But now it's going to have a larger number of spans, just like my original curve. Now, as you can see, when it plays back, it's actually moving pretty slow. If you actually go into your hair system settings, go down to dynamic properties, that it's moving pretty slow because there's a couple of things going on. You have drag turned on and tangential drag. If you actually set these to zero, the movement will look a little more natural. And you could increase the mass just to make it look heavier. So if I rewind it and I press play, it moves a little faster now. It's still moving a little slow right now, but that's mainly because it's trying to calculate while I'm doing a screen capture. Uh, so, with this curve selected, I can go back into its settings. Let me just rewind so it puts it back to its default location. It's dynamic, so to actually put your dynamic curve back to the start or its initial state, you need to rewind the timeline. So it zeroes out all the calculations. And so as I was talking about uh, under foggle shape, you have point lock, which actually controls whether or not the curve is actually uh, attached to either end of its source curve. And so you can completely detach it, so it just completely falls away when you press play. So it just drops away entirely. Or you could just detach one end of it. So in this case, I'll uh, tell it to only lock down the base of the curve, and then if I press rewind and I press play, you see that it actually now drops away from my curve. Now another cool thing you can do with this dynamic curve is you can actually set a ground plane for it just by adjusting some settings in the nucleus. So I need to select my nucleus, and then come over to the attribute editor and go to nucleus. And under nucleus, I can tell it to use plane, and it'll basically use the grid gra grid as your ground plane. So because the default origin for that is zero, so this zero of the grid will be the zero, the ground for our dynamic element, and anything else using the same nucleus. So when the, our curve falls, it hits the ground at that level. And let me actually turn the grid lines off. Just to make the changes a little more apparent. And I'll even make the fit lines thicker. Under shading, you can go to thicker lines, just so you can increase the uh, density, the, the visibility of your mesh while you're working. And as you can see, it makes the lines a little thicker depending on what settings I have. So they're a little easier to see. Okay. So the great thing with dynamic curves is you can actually have curves also control geometry. So if I had a cylinder, for example, and I will just quickly grab some faces and I'll extrude it uh, just along this curve really quick. Okay, so that's extruded now. And let me add a few more divisions just so it follows the arc a little more. And I can add divisions here in its history so that it actually follows the arc. Okay, so now we have our base geometry.
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the wire tool to pretty much just make it follow our geo. So I'm activating the wire tool and now it wants me to select the shape that I wanted to form which I've already done. So I'm going to select that, press enter and then it asks me to select the curve. I'm going to do that from the uh, outliner and what I want to select is the dynamic curve which is curve 2, the second curve created and then press enter and as you can see with that curve selected it's influencing the geometry now so now when I press play it's influencing the geometry but obviously not enough so let me select my geometry and I just need to go in and tell it to influence a larger area. So I can go to the history and go to inputs for the geometry and I select wire one which is the history for the the wire tool and then I need to increase the drop off distance if I remember correctly to uh, get it to influence a larger area. Now let's see if that's enough yeah, there we go. So as you can see, it's now deforming with the dynamic curve. And as you can see, the curve actually impacts the ground. Now let me activate the grid. And let's talk about the collision just for a second here. Now the collision is actually uh, being calculated based on the curve. So what you need to do is you need to actually tell Maya how far away from the curve it needs to calculate so that it looks like this tube is actually impacting the ground. Uh, the first thing I want to do is I'm actually going to lower the ground plane. Actually, no, I'll leave the ground plane as is. That's fine. Um, you can lower the ground plane just from the nucleus. You just set the, the negative, the Y at a negative value and it'll lower the ground plane. Um, so right now I'm going to change the collision width or the recognized collision offset for our curve. So I have the curve selected, open up the attribute editor and I need to go to the uh, hair system settings for the curve. So it's basically the hair system shape tab in the attribute editor. And then you want to find the section that says dynamic properties. And beneath uh, and right above that, you have collisions. And that's what you need to set. So you expand collisions. And then you have a few things that you probably want to turn on so it makes it a little easier for you to make the adjustments. So first of all, this solver display. And we're going to tell it collision thickness. And we're going to have it show the collision thickness. Right now, we don't see any change because the, the thickness is pretty much equal to zero. And so then we need to actually change the collision uh, thickness, or in this case, the collide with offset. And I'm going to set it for about 0.2. And let me rewind my timeline. I don't know if you saw that, but when I did that, when I activated it, when I did the rewind, it showed a brand new shape. So let me turn off the, uh, there you go, Let's see it for a second. If I select the curve right around that curve you see a little dense area of mesh that is actually the collision thickness if I turn it off you'll see it goes away and so right now that's the area that it's calculating for the collision because I increased it from 0 to 0 0.2 so I'm going to bring it up to about 0.6 and see if that matches the width of our uh, cylinder it's better now as you notice the ends are actually overextending a little bit so that's something you probably wanted to uh, take into account when you create your geometry and when you're animating. Uh, so let's bring it up to about 0.8 see if that's closer. Got to hit rewind to see it recalculate again. So that's much closer but I'm going to put it all the way up to uh, let's say 9.95 and then press my rewind again and so that's pretty much dead on. So now if I rewind and I press play for the collision to happen, notice it pretty much stops flush with the uh, edge. 
of our geometry. And let me just uh, shade that in. And so that's what the collision area, the collision uh, thickness looks like when you're displaying it. Let me actually turn that off just so we can focus on the geometry. So I'm going to rewind again, just press play. And you'll see that the geometry actually collides with the, or it looks like it's colliding with the ground plane now. Okay, and so that's adjusting the basic behavior and the collision. And if you want to get a little more control in there, you can actually create uh, little transform constraints. Uh, since it is using the it's uh, using NCLOF now, you can actually use those to control it. In the past, you specifically create uh, a hair constraint. So I'm going to uh, hide my polys just for a second. Now, if you're going to create a constraint, you're pretty much all you have to do is going to select any CVs on the surface of your curve and you can actually do it mid animation uh, midstream during animation um, at any point if you need a character to pr pretty much suddenly grab the string you could create the little transform constraint there attached to the character's hand you could even set it up ahead of time uh, so you're simply going to remember in your end dynamics menu so I need to make sure I'm back in end dynamics under uh, the end constraint menu, that's end constraint, not constraint, uh, end constraint menu for end dynamics, you're going to choose your CVs or whichever other components you want to control, and you're going to tell it to create a transform constraint. And so it creates a little locator, and you'll see a few points around it representing the connection between all of your uh, CVs and the transform and you can actually control the behavior of that constraint by default it's going to give you like a string, uh, spring constraint but if you really want to lock down a connection you want to switch your constraint method to weld so it becomes a much more solid connection and you can actually animate a lot of a lot of these settings so you could set it up so that the connections actually break it actually releases things uh, drops them one of the simplest ways to do this is you select your uh, dynamic constraint and if you go to the uh, channels box oops, sorry about that getting a little lag here because of the capture if you go to your channels box you actually have uh, an enable and a disable so you can turn it on and off if you want it to you could actually do things like uh, have the strength go weak uh, and that will actually release it. There's also glue strength that you can play around with, but the simplest way is to pretty much just switch the dynamic off for the uh, dynamic constraint. But right now with it active, let me uh, kill these menus. If I press play, you'll see that the curve sort of sticks there. And if I do an interactive playback, which is under uh, end solver and interactive playback, if I do an interactive playback, that means I can go in just while the timeline's active, switch to my move tool, and I can actually grab the end, the trans, the uh, transform constraint, and actually do a little animation within the dynamics and controlling the end of the curve, basically. And once again, if I activate the polys, you'll see that they're following along naturally and. Uh, everything is doing what it's supposed to be. Everything's colliding with the ground plane, so I'll go below the ground plane and I'll press play and you'll see it's draping and colliding and being controlled at the same time. Now you can do sort of the same thing uh, using joint chains and using the dynamic curve in place of the spline IK, uh, which I've actually demonstrated in the past with uh, my dynamic hair system tutorial. Uh, but 
this one uh, shows how to do make the connection between the geometry and the dynamic curve using a uh, simple deformer instead of uh, having to assign joints and paint weights or anything like that. So just another option for you. In my 2013, remember in this case it's N hair instead of your standard hair. Okay, a couple of warnings here about uh, dynamic curves. Uh, once you do have your dynamics for your curve set up, you want to remember not to do a couple of things. For one, do not delete history on any of your hair system curves or any of the hair systems or anything like that. Everything that was used to create the dynamic curve must be maintained. This means you cannot delete the original curve. If you delete the original curve, you break the system. If you delete history on, if you uh, optimize your scene, if you're not careful, you can also damage the system that way. So you want to be very careful uh, when, once you actually have the system set up. This original curve always influences the dynamic curve. Basically, if I move the original up like that, and then I press rewind, notice the original, the dynamic curve, and everything attached that's following the dynamic curve moves to realign with the original curve. So you need to keep it. And if you're building this into a rig, you need to make sure that you take that original curve and you have the original curve locked down so it follows your character. Um, this way, even if your dynamics are disabled, everything that's attached to that, K, that curve will stay aligned with the character as well, or the object that it's uh, basically attached to, whether or not you're doing uh, tubes on a character, or chains, or uh, something like that on some sort of machine. Uh, the dynamics themselves, when the dynamics are active, you can pretty much use the end constraints to control its behavior because those aren't locked into the original curve. Uh, as you can see, I created the transform constraint at a specific spot while the curve was in that position after having calculated a certain distance. Notice when I rewind and play it back, it doesn't snap to it. It just starts calculating its control from wherever that locator was left. So that's something to keep in mind too when you're working with it. It's not going to snap to the locator. That can actually be very good, but it can also be a problem. Make sure your locator is in the spot where you want the curve to begin, or what you can do is before you actually even turn the uh, locator on, make sure that the curve is down to it, or put the locator up to wherever you want it to be. You could even uh, use some of the dynamic options and set an initial state for your curve so that if you want the curve to, let's say, begin in a lower position like this, uh, begin its calculations from, let's say, a pre-calculated position like this, you'd have to select that curve. Let me stop the play for a second. You'd have to select that curve, and then in my settings, it actually lets you... Uh, uh, set uh, an initial state and that's under the uh, I believe it's under the end solver menu you have initial state and I can set from current position if it'll let me I'm actually getting an error on that but uh, you should be able to set an initial position for it you can do the same thing with um, you can do the same thing with end clock but yeah, so um, maybe it doesn't recognize it yet for the end hair, or maybe I need to pull it specifically from the end hair menu, which is probably more likely. So let me actually just do that really quick. I'm gonna let it drop. We'll leave it there, and I'll go to the end hair menu, and we'll see. Yeah, we have a here set start position. You can say set from current, and that looks like that's done. And if I rewind. So I rewound and it didn't actually reset to that initial created state and it starts calculating from where I left it. So that's another handy tool. Okay. So remember, uh, maintain your original curve at all costs and be very careful when you're cleaning up your scenes. Make sure that you don't accidentally delete history on any of the dynamic elements because you could easily break something. Because remember, um, Essentially, there are deformers that are added in here to control the mesh. Uh, 